good to be uh, here with you today to share the word and be a part of this, of this series. Um, I want to, uh, I'm going to share a, a couple of stories today in line with this, the, the section of Jonah that I'm going to be, be highlighting. And so I want to just jump right into it. Um, at the end of Jonah chapter two, it was interesting. And I was thinking, you know, as I was standing there, I'm like, okay, man, Jonah says a few words at the end of chapter two, but I didn't put those words on the slide. I'm thinking about maybe reading the end of Jonah chapter two. And then Sean gets up and reads the end of Jonah chapter two. <laughs> Where, you know, Jonah's in this, he's in this great fish and, uh, and he has this prayer. And in this prayer, you see he has a change in his perspective, a change, a change of heart, a change that's happened in him. And then at the beginning of chapter three, which we're going to start today, um, we see that God initiates the call a second time, and now there is a different, a different response. So let's let's dive into that. Jonah chapter, chapter three. Um, I think I may on the slide to put chapter one, but it's chapter three, beginning of verse one, it says, then the Lord spoke to Jonah a second time, a second time, get up and go to the great city of Nineveh and deliver the message I have given you. So God has spoke to Jonah in chapter one. I want you to go to Nineveh. So Jonah's like, I'm not going. Then in Jonah chapter two, we see that God uses a storm to arrest Jonah and a great fish to incarcerate Jonah. And in this setting, Jonah rethinks his decision. Maybe running is not the best idea especially if you're running from the person who created the whole earth, you really have no hiding place. God doesn't, doesn't do well with the game of hide and seek. Ask, ask Adam. Right? Hide in the bushes and God walks right up to him. Say, Adam, what you doing behind those bushes, bro? <laughs> He's like, uh, uh, you can, <laughs> can you see me? <laughs> yeah, we can, we can see. He doesn't. Oh, hiding thing. Now, David, David actually figured out. He's like, where can I go from your presence? If I ascend to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, you're there. Like, your presence is just everywhere. Like, David, David, he understood it. Jonah didn't. Jonah did. But he figured it out. Didn't take a long time. Uh, we all, no matter what it looks like, we all have to figure it out. There's a change of heart that happens in Jonah in chapter 2. And so in chapter 3, the word of the Lord comes to Jonah a second time. Now let's try this again. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh and deliver the message I have given you. That's all I want you to do. That's all I wanted you to do from the beginning, was to deliver the message I have given you. Verse 3, this time Jonah obeyed the Lord's command, and he went to Nineveh. Now, if you missed some of the other uh, history in the previous messages, some of you here maybe here for the first time, Nineveh is the capital of a country called Assyria, and it was a really powerful, powerful country. So Nineveh is like their Washington, D.C. It's, it's the capital. A lot, of, a lot of people there is really big. So go to the capital of this nation that has been doing a lot of evil stuff. This time, Jonah obeys the command. He went to Nineveh, a city so large that it took three days to see it all, like Disneyland. <laughs> took three days to see it all. On the day Jonah entered the city, he shouted to the crowds, 40 days from now, Nineveh will be destroyed. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. <laughs> That's it. Now look what happens. The people of Nineveh believed God's message, and from the greatest to the least, 
they declared a fast and put on burlap to show their sorrow. Burlap is like some cloths that they put on if you're mourning or weeping or showing sorrow, they put on these special like grieving clothes. Now, in my mind, I'm thinking, if I'm going to hear that a whole city turned around from their evil because of a message, I'd want to know what was the message. I'd want to know how did he start off with his introduction? How did he connect with his audience? What points did he use? Did all the points start with the same letter? Man, he must have had a powerful testimony. Maybe he, I would have thought he would have come out and said, guys, listen, I've got a whale of a tale to share with you. Trust me, you don't want to disobey the God out who sent me, right? That's a lot of fish to swallow up all of y'all. If we do the same thing that happened to me, that's a lot of fish. He doesn't do that. He just says, 40 days from now, this city will be destroyed. Now, these people hear God's message. So, so there's a lot in this context, in this passage, in this story, a lot of even nuances in here that aren't spelled out by the writer. First of all, for him to come out and say, in 40 days, God is going to destroy this city. Well, he says 40 days, the city will be destroyed. And they understand it to be a message from God. So there's a lot of possibilities here. What gave Jonah the kind of credibility to Nineveh where he would make this declaration and they would understand this is someone we should be listening to, not this is somebody who was crazy. This is a lunatic. We should just lock him up and carry on with what we're doing. It doesn't happen that way. He says 40 days from now, Nineveh will be destroyed. And they're all like, wait, 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 what? Like this is, there's something real about it. There's something powerful about these words. And here's what I want to tell you. Here's what I want to tell you. This is it. This is it. The words alone don't carry power by themselves in a way that if someone else said the very same thing, they would get the very same results. The power is in the person who gave Jonah the words and Jonah spoke the words that God gave him. That's where the power is. There's nothing miraculous about the words themselves. That's not what stirs things up in the spirit. There's nothing powerful about this particular formula. It's not like I can go, okay, so Jonah said, in 40 days now, Nineveh, you'll be destroyed. Oh man, I should go to DC and then share them that same message. I should just fly out there and stand on the Capitol 40 days from now. <laughs> DC is gonna be jacked up. And they wait for everyone to repent. It doesn't work that way because it's not a formula. It's not a formula. This worked when Jonah said it because God called Jonah. This message worked when Jonah said it because these were the words God gave Jonah. When God calls Jonah and tells Jonah, Get up and go to the city and deliver the message I've given you. Don't make up stuff. Don't add stuff. Don't take away. Deliver the message I've given you. And when you deliver the message I have given you, then there will be results that I intend from the message I've given you. If you change the message, don't expect the results. If you add to it, the results will be the same. If you take away from it, the results will be the same. Deliver the message I have given to you, and then I will continue to do some work. Now, here's the interesting thing you got to know. Anytime you see this kind of response, the messenger delivers a message, and people turn just like that, you've got to know God was already at work before the message got there. You see how fast that was? 40 days from now, and Nineveh's going to be destroyed. And all of a sudden, people know, man, we got to change how we are living. We've got to change how we're treating each other. How we're We've got to change even the gods that we were worshiping. Something's real and powerful about this one right here. We sense the supremacy on the words of this particular prophet. And whoever sent him is more powerful than the ones that we've been worshiping. Deliver the message I have given to you. And when you deliver the message I have given to you, 
then my plan for that message and my plan for the people receiving that message will come to fruition because I will begin to put some other things in place and connect some dots and I'm just using you as part of my plan to carry out my purpose for the people I have sent you to. Now here's, here's, but see, here's what's crazy. Here's what's crazy. Now, it would have been really, really great if the book of Jonah started with chapter 3. But it didn't. God had his heart for the people of Nineveh, but Jonah didn't. How could Jonah, who does not have a heart for the people of Nineveh, convey a message from a God who has a heart for the people of Nineveh? If God's going to call the prophet and speak to the prophet, then God has to first change the heart of the prophet. So he have a heart when he shares the message that comes from the heart of God. What's interesting is that this message is a message. It's a message of repentance. And guess what? Guess what God, God does in the life of Jonah? He knows he's going to use Jonah to convey a message of repentance to a capital city and subsequently a nation. A message of repentance. Repent from rejecting God. Repent from rebelling against God. Repent from trying to go your own way. And who's more qualified to share that message than somebody with a fresh encounter <laughs> of doing the same thing? So Jonah is running from God. He realizes it's not a good idea. God has a plan. God has some words for Jonah. Jonah is disobeying God, and Jonah finds out, man, this is not cool. Jonah repents, and he begins to obey God. And God says, now, Jonah, we'll come again. Now you've got a different experience to launch this message off of. So now this person who had rebelled from God, now obeying God. He had rebelled from God, repented to God, is now obeying God, carrying a message to people who are rebelling against God, who need to repent to God and turn to God. God changes Jonah. And it's that change that gives him a whole nother experience as he shares this message with the people of Nineveh. Now, what I find interesting about this is that there is a parallel with what God is doing in Jonah and in Nineveh with what God does with believers. God called Jonah, changed Jonah, and now Jonah's prepared to be, to be sent. He wanted to go to, God wanted to go the first time, but he had a little issue, right? But now he's changed. Now he has them a commission. Go deliver the message I've given you. And now Jonah goes with a different heart. He delivers a message, and there are results. When, when you and I look at this same principle and dynamic in the New Testament, there's some things I want us to, I want us to examine. First of all, oh, we'll get to the Olympics in a second. Um, first of all, in... Second Corinthians chapter five. We, we, we're, we're people who used to be in darkness. Now we're called into the light, right? A change has happened for us. Right? We see a parallel here. Second Corinthians chapter five, begin verse 17. Paul says this to the Corinthians. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and see the new has come. Everything is from God who has reconciled us to himself through Christ, right? There's a change. He's reconciled us. So we have a God of reconciliation, a God who reconciles, who, who brings back to himself. And now, if, let me add a layer of, of clarity here. To, to reconcile means to bring back together some things that were together and became apart. 
right? To reconcile, to bring back. So from a, a worldview, a biblical worldview perspective, we see that God and humanity were united, but when sin entered the world, when Adam and Eve ate off of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they brought sin into the world, they disobeyed God, that's how sin entered. Then there was a separation. Now every human being is born with that separation. So it's through Jesus Christ that we're able to come back to God and be reconciled, be reunited with God through Jesus Christ. And so Paul is saying that those of us who put our faith in Christ, this God of reconciliation has reconciled us. He's made us new. He's changed us. And now watch how he does the same thing that he was doing with Jonah. He has changed us. Watch what ends up happening. Not only has he changed us through Christ, he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Those who are reconciled are the only people qualified to share a message of reconciliation. If you are not united with God, you can't share the good news of what it's like to be united with God. Only those who have been reconciled, those whose sins have been forgiven, those who experience the grace of God that you can't earn it, you don't deserve it like we sing today, you can't earn it, you don't deserve it, but still he gives himself away. Only those who've experienced the reckless love of God and the grace of God that forgives us when we don't deserve it and forgives us completely and utterly every thought, word, action, deed, past, present, future, only those who've experienced that can share that as good news. Because we're sharing something that's not just a philosophy that's passed on that we just memorize and repeat and share. No, we're sharing it as an experience. In Jonah chapter 2, he had an experience. Not just that it's not a good idea to run from God, but an experience of the grace of God who gives you another chance. Yeah, Jonah, you should have drowned, but you didn't. Our message to people today is... You're right, you don't deserve it. I feel like I don't deserve it. You don't. We agree, you don't. You don't. You should drown in your sin. We deserve that. We don't deserve this. That's why it's good news that he offers it to everyone who believes. So Paul is saying that those who have been reconciled to God through Christ, now he has given us a ministry of reconciliation. Well, what is this ministry of reconciliation? Verse 19, that is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. This is how he reconciles them. He is a perfectly righteous and holy God with perfectly unrighteous and unholy people. How does he become united with them? He has to provide some way for them to become holy and righteous and, and spotless and pure to be uh, compatible with him. And so in his holiness and his righteousness, he doesn't become unholy so he, he can be compatible to us. Instead, he makes us holy to be compatible with him. That, that's the good, because he's the Lord. He doesn't, he doesn't change. He, he has been eternally good, eternally righteous, righteous, eternally spotless, eternally that way. And so we are the ones that messed up. We're the ones that need to be cleansed. So to make us his children, united with him, he has to send Jesus Christ who puts on our sin on himself and he gives his righteousness to us as a gift. He makes this swap on the cross. And those who say, you know what? I'm taking the Jesus swap. I'm believing that Christ gives me righteousness and Christ takes on my sin. And God says, anybody who believes that, you are in. That's all it takes is to just believe that Christ is enough. To believe that the blood Christ shed on the cross for you is enough to cleanse you and purify you and make you holy in the, in the sight of God. Maybe not holy inside of your parents, but holy in the sight of God. Maybe not holy in the sight of your spouse, but holy in the sight of God. Maybe not holy holy in the sight of your kids, but holy in the sight of God. Maybe not holy because you feel it, but holy in the sight of God. And so Paul is saying, this is how he, he makes us he makes us righteous. He, he's not counting their trespasses against them if you put your faith in Christ. And so he has committed the message of reconciliation to us. You see that? The message of reconciliation. So we see uh, in verse 18, so everything is from God who has reconciled us. We have a God of reconciliation. 
people don't understand it. They think he's an angry God. They think he's trying to point out their faults, point out their sins. They think people say, well, if I go to church, I'm just going to burn up. Like, cause you, you, you. You're not going to burn up. Not yet. Not yet. That's what they think of him. So they need somebody to tell him, to tell them he's a God of reconciliation. So we have a God of reconciliation who gives us the ministry of reconciliation. What is the ministry of reconciliation? Sharing the message of reconciliation. What's the message of reconciliation? He says in verse 20, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. As God is making his appeal through us, we plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. That's the message. Be reconciled to God. Come back to God. There's a way back to God. It's through Jesus. It's through Jesus. It's through Jesus. And the world says, it's not fair for there to only be one way. There can't possibly be one way. That's what Oprah said, right? There can't possibly be one way. A lot of folks say, there can't possibly be one way. If God is fair and God is just, there can't just possibly be one way. And the reality is, I heard, I think it was R.C. Sproul mentioned this, he hollered he says, he says, um, he says, what's wrong with you people? <laughs> He's funny, He's an old guy with gray hair. You know, what do you say to people who say that it can't just be one way? It can't just be one way. What's wrong with you people? There doesn't even have to be one way. The question is, why is there even a way at all? complaining about there only being one way, there doesn't even have to be a way at all. He gave us a way. And now you're trying to say that way is not good enough. There's got to be multiple ways. If you really loved us and cared about us and it's really just, there's got to be multiple ways. No, no. There is a way to be united with a holy God. There is a way for your sins to be completely forgiven. There is a way. That is the good news. Be reconciled to God. And so this passage here says, God's making his appeal through us, which is what he was doing in Jonah. God was making his appeal through Jonah. But today, God's making his appeal through us. And our message is be reconciled to God, that there's ways through Jesus Christ. That's why I've, I've entitled this message, deliver the message I've given to you. That's it. Deliver the message I have given to you. Same thing you told Jonah, same thing he's telling us. Deliver the message that I have given to you. Be reconciled to God. There is a way for your sins to be forgiven. That God is not mad at you, that God does love you, and that your sins, no matter how bad you feel about them, no matter if you should be in jail right now because of them, whatever those sins are, God will forgive you through Jesus Christ. And if you don't stand before God in Christ, and you stand before God just in yourself, that's when it's going to be a problem. But right now, today, right now, you have an opportunity to put your faith in Jesus Christ and walk across the bridge of Jesus to get to God from the place of sin that you're in right now. The only way from darkness to light is through Jesus Christ. The only way from sin to salvation is through Jesus Christ. The only way from death, hell, and the grave to everlasting life with God, it is through Jesus Christ. I don't care if you think it ain't fair. That's not the point. That's not what truth is all about. The truth doesn't bend according to your feelings. Truth is truth no matter what, no matter what country, no matter what nation, no matter what ethnicity, no matter what sexual orientation, no matter what political party truth, it will always be truth. And the way is through Jesus Christ. That's it. That's it. Deliver the message that I have given to you. Our message has some similarities with Jonah's message. There is a warning in Jonah's message, and there is a warning in our message. Jesus talked about it quite frequently, that there's going to be a place, there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I'm here so that you don't have to go there, but if you choose to reject me, you're choosing to go there, you need to be warned about that. But the idea of salvation is not to escape hell. The idea of salvation is to be with God. It's to be with him. It's to find life from our eternal death. It's to find eternal life. And it's to look at the whole world and say, you know what? 
I'm going to put my hand, my life, in the hands of the person who created this whole thing. Like, oh, you can't look at this and be like, oh, it just happened. It, what kind of foolishness is that? Like, that's just crazy. So, but here's the problem, though. Here's the problem that the world has with our message and the problem that some Christians have with this message. That's why they're uncomfortable sharing this message. And the, the problem is this, that in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1, Paul mentions this a little bit. I'm just going to read through this relatively fast. Um, so let's just dive. So the, the problem is this, that because our message is come back to God and be reconciled to him through what Christ has done on the cross, this is, this is what Paul highlights. Paul says, the message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction. And what he means by that is that it doesn't make sense. It doesn't add up. It doesn't appeal to the rational senses. It's not according to human wisdom. It, because it's not like a man mapped out a plan of salvation that makes sense to man. This plan has come from God. It doesn't make sense to people. This message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction. Well, how do you mean that the person who's going to save me died? That's not a good look. You mean the person who died is going to give me life, but he's dead? No, 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 no. Not the whole story. He came back to life. He is alive and is the giver of life. He walked through death so that when you walk through it, it doesn't sting. <laughs> He conquered. So you got to know how to answer stuff like that. He conquered death. He walked right through it. Now death is not the end. Death is just a door. Oh, yeah. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are headed for destruction. But we who are being saved know it is the very power of God. Now watch this irrationality here. As the scripture says, this is Paul right to the Corinthians, quoting a verse from Isaiah. I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and discard the intelligence of the intelligent. So where does this leave the philosophers, the scholars, the world's brilliant debaters? God has made the wisdom of this world look foolish. Because since God in his wisdom saw to it that the world would never know him through human wisdom, he has used our foolish preaching to save those who believe it is foolish to the jews who ask for signs from heaven and it is foolish to the greeks who seek human wisdom so when we preach that christ was crucified the jews are offended and the gentiles say it's nonsense deliver the message i've given you i'm not changing the message because the greeks want it to be philosophically appeasing. I'm not changing the message because the Jews want to see all these different signs and stuff. The Old Testament is proof. I can do signs and he still won't believe. <laughs> right? But to those who God called to salvation, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. This foolish plan, and Paul calls it a foolish plan because, again, he's using it, from, he's talking about it from the perspective of the people. He's saying this plan is looked at as foolish because it doesn't, make, it doesn't add up. It doesn't appeal to the rational mind. Uh, this foolish plan of God is wiser than the wisest human plans, and God's weakness is stronger than the greatest of human strength. So this mess, here's the thing, this message, we're just saying words. You know, we're just saying words. But the power of those words is the same power when Jonah said what Jonah said. There's nothing powerful just about the word. There's not a formula there. The fact is that Jonah said what God said, and that's where the power was. The power is in the author of the words, not the messenger of the words. Come on now. The power is in the author. It's in the author. The message of salvation, it saves people because God uses it to save people. It's, it doesn't matter if you, if you articulate it the best way you want to articulate it. It doesn't matter if when you're trying to share Jesus, you forget where that scripture is. It doesn't matter. It's not about the form. It's not about a, a perfect presentation. Because I'll tell you right now, you can have a perfect presentation and no one gets saved. And then on the other hand, you can stumble over every possible thing and people fall to the knees crying and weeping and they're getting saved. Why? Because it's the messenger, the, 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 the message from the ultimate messenger. It's God making his appeal through you, through you. God knows that you have issues, but just deliver the message he's given to you. 
He knows you don't get it right all the time, but deliver the message that he's given to you. He knows that your life doesn't always line up with the message he's given to you, but deliver the message he's given to you. Deliver it on a good day and deliver it on a bad day. Deliver the message I have given to you. That there is a way back to God. And it is through Jesus. And it might not sound rational to you. It might not make sense to you. It doesn't add up to human wisdom. That's why you don't discover this through research. You discover it through revelation. God reveals himself to people. He reveals himself to their hearts. The power is in the message because that's the message God chose to save people. So Paul calls it the foolishness of preaching. Here we are just talking about Jesus coming and Jesus dying and Jesus being raised again and people's eternal uh, 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 eternal lives uh, come up in their spirit. Like they become alive spiritually. Like you, you can't do that. You can't reach into somebody's spirit and flip the light on. You couldn't do it to your own self. But Paul tells the Ephesians that we are made alive in in Christ that when we are just preaching and telling and we might not feel like anything is happening we might not feel like we did it the very best that we could we we might just you know if you're like me you go man I should have done this I should after every message I should have done this, I should have said this right we try to critique because we want to do it better but the reality is that God uses it he uses it but we got to put more faith in God's power than we do in our presentation we got to put more faith in God's power than we do in our own performance and so when you do that you don't have to be afraid of rejection you don't have to be afraid of how it's going to happen because it's God's message he knows you're going to mess it up when he gave it to you <laughs> hear me you're not surprising him if you fumble over stuff the fumbling is part of the process just deliver the message I've given to you. And when you deliver it, you ain't got to deliver it like me. You don't have to deliver it like Sean or like Aaron. You don't have to deliver it like Ken. Or, no, you deliver it the way God gave it to you to deliver it. And you go to the place God told you to go to. In, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, and this is where I'll think about closing. In Acts, in Acts chapter 1, it says, Jesus says this, he, he's been raised from the dead. He's now about to commission his folks again in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you'll be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. Now a lot of people have looked at this from a missiological perspective and go, what, what, what do these different regions mean? And some have said Jerusalem is like your home, your, 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 the place where you have your closer relationships. And then Judea is those a little bit outside of that. It's some of your neighbors that you might know, uh, of, might be familiar with them, or maybe have some depth of relationship, but, but they're just a little bit outside of your normal circle, your more close personal circle. That's the Judea. But then Samaria, if you're talking to Jews about going to Samaria, Samaria is the marginalized people. Samaria is the people that you don't want to go to. Samaria is the people who might be ethnically different from you. It's the people who might be different from you in any other kind of way. That's Samaria. Samaria, Samaria, S-A-M-A-I-A-R-I, -I, Samaria, right? Go to Samaria. So if you're a Jew hearing Jesus say, go to Samaria, he's saying, go to the people that you're uncomfortable going to. I'm sending you to them. And that's Jonah's issue. That's Jonah's issue. He didn't want to go to Nineveh. He wasn't familiar with Nineveh as far as, uh, you know, relationally. He didn't have connection with them. He saw them as people that he didn't want to go to. He saw them as people who deserved God's wrath and deserved God's punishment, who did not deserve a chance. And then God showed Jonah. What it's like to deserve, to not deserve a chance, but still get one. Now that you understand, now you've shifted from being all holy and mighty, all high and mighty over here. Now you understand when you need another chance and you get one and you don't deserve one. Now share this message with the same people who I want to give another chance. So you and I in our world, there are people today, you don't even think deserve a chance. When you saw the stuff at the Olympics, you were angry. Well, listen, if they intentionally mocked God it meant they were far from God. If they did not intentionally mock God, but put on display their worship of idol gods, they are far from God. They are far from God over here, far from God over here. That's the issue. That's the issue. 
They ain't mocking my Jesus. The same Jesus who you used to mock? That you, that you, oh, you, now you're mad? Now, you, now you're mad? Wait, wait, no, the same Jesus who told you stop sleeping in that person's bed and you still kept on doing it? You mad that they're mocking that Jesus? You mad that they're mocking the Jesus who was watching you shoot up all those times? Who saved you from the overdose? You mad that they're mocking that same Jesus? The Jesus who stood there with you is the Jesus who's standing there with them. Let me, let me, I've decided to close now. So let me, <laughs> let me share with you this. See, this really sounds good when we're singing about ourselves. There's no shadow you won't light up, no mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, no lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. But wait a minute. That sounds really nice and sweet when you're thinking about you. But let's change the words a little bit. And what I want you to do is put in your mind the image of that whole Last Supper fantasy, whatever the thing. <laughs> the, whole, the whole drag show, the whole display at the table. Put your mind, I want you to visualize that in your mind. Now let's, let's, let's edit these words a little bit. There's no shadow you won't light up. Mountain you won't climb up coming after them. There's no wall you won't kick down, no lie you won't tear down, coming after them. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases them down and fights till they're found. Yeah. They couldn't earn it. They couldn't deserve it. Still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Deliver the message I've given to you. And I'll take it from there. That's all for now. <laughs>